Hey everyone, thanks for joining Learn to Play Games. My name is Lance and I'm here with Sherman today talking about Resident Evil 3. This is a brand new game on Kickstarter right now and we're going to take you through the first demo of Resident Evil 3 and then also talk a little bit about some of the other things that maybe some of you have had questions on and some of the things that I'm interested in finding out as well from one of the main designers of the game. So thank you so much Sherman for joining us today. And uh, thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about this demo. Is there any kind of backstory to this? Is this like the introduction to Resident Evil 3 or what is going on here? No worries. So um, this is actually the intro. Well, it's actually a slightly modified version of the, uh, of the very basic tutorial um, in the Resident Evil 3 rulebook. So it's the way that the first, the very first thing we use to teach you the order of activation of how to play the game. So the core mechanics. Um, so it tells you how to move your characters around, how enemies activate, and kind of how to draw from the tension deck. And that's really the focus. And we knew that would be a really good way to build a demo, because obviously it's exactly what the purpose is in the rulebook. That said, um, one thing that we also did is provide a few extra elements to this, so that way it kind of feels that's got that little bit more um, excitement in it, a little bit more showing people you know, some of the things they can expect in RE3. So it's all sort of pointers, just a few, a few bits and pieces here and there to kind of give them an idea. That sounds really cool. Uh, one other thing I do want to point out, I am still fairly new at Tabletopia and doing this online stuff, so please give me some feedback down in the comments below. Let me know if there's anything else that you guys would like to see moving into the future or anything like that. And I do apologize for some of the clinkiness of this. I'm, I'm still working my way through some of this. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump in. And uh, I think it was your turn first. So let's see how this works. And you're, who, which character are you playing? I'm playing Jill Valentine, uh, so the uh, eponymous heroine of um, of Resident Evil 3. So, I mean, uh, first thing, Resident Evil 3, much like Resident Evil 2, still uses the core survival uh, survival horror engine. So you still have no enemy turns. It's still very fast-paced and dynamic. So we still have an action phase, a reaction phase, and a tension phase. So if, for example, if I go first, um, I have a reaction phase first. I have four actions in this phase. And they are things where I interact with my environment. So I might move around, search for items, attack enemies, that sort of stuff. So I'm going to go one to here. That's my first action. For my second action, uh, I'm going to jump into this square here. And now I'm in same square as an enemy. Now, if I want to do any more actions, then I have to make an evade roll first. Because the enemy tries to attack me. If I'm close up to an enemy, it will try to attack me in what's called an hour sequence reaction. The one exception to this is making an attack against it. Now, I don't necessarily, I want to save my ammo, because ultimately, as you will know from previous, uh, from previous experience of Resident Evil 2, Resident Evil games are about resource management. They're about, they're not just simply zombie blasters. You can't just throw dice at the problem until it goes away. You do have to think very, very carefully about how to progress. So I don't necessarily know I want to worry about too much about this enemy, because once I'm out of this corridor, I'm never coming back to it. Yeah. So with that in mind, I've got one, two, so let's keep on going. So I need to make an evade roll. Now, if I look at my card, uh, I can see I have two of eight dice, so that means it means I'm trying to roll two of these blue dice here. I'm looking to get any of the arrows on them. So if we have a look, we've got a small evade here, we've got a medium evade next to it with the dotted lines following it, and then there's a large evade, which is uh, a contiguous arrow, which basically effectively fills in the dotted lines around the edge. To make a successful evade for an enemy like this, all I need to do is roll any no any number of these arrows. So let's quickly roll them. And typically, of course, I've failed. I've not rolled any of it whatsoever. <laughs> so this means I've been hit. So first thing that happens is if I go to my uh, my player board, then I've, this health track marker moves down one level because the zombie does one damage when it hits me. The next thing is because I've been bitten, I can push the zombie away. So I go to here. I can push it in any direction I want. These red lines here are walls, so I can't cross it over to there. I will push it to this corner here. So I've got one, two, I try to do a move, and unfortunately I failed, which means that move is wasted. But I now get my fourth action, and I will move one step to here. I'm also going to turn my character around to uh, look in the direction I'm going. <laughs> so with that in mind, oh, it's just a small thing. There's no there's no actual direction in this game, but it looks nice. But I'm at least Absolutely. looking where I'm running off to. If I was doing that, I may be why I didn't get bit. But anyway, <laughs> so having done that, um, now we move into the reaction phase. So as I said, there's no enemy turns in Resident Evil, but any enemies who are on the same tile as you uh, will react to you as you run past or you make noise. And these are what's called reactions. So this enemy, for example, will have a reaction. Now, if 
they are in range to attack me, and zombies have a range of zero, so it means the target needs to be in the same square, it would try to attack. Because it can't, it will move instead. Zombies move one square, so this zombie will lurch after me. Now, none of these other enemies will react at all, because they don't know I'm here yet. They can't see me, they can't hear me. If I quickly grab this and flip it over, if this door was open, then it would react, because the zombie could hear me, it would sort of lurch down, you know, lurch closer, that sort of stuff. For the moment, though, it's okay, so I'll flip that back over. So the last turn, uh, the last phase of the turn, is the tension phase. The tension phase is where we draw a card from the tension deck, and that represents our character's growing sense of unease. It's that sort of creeping fear that anybody playing Resident Evil has that something's about to happen. And there are some jump scares in here, and there are some narrative twists and turns. Um, but I'll quickly grab my top, top card here, flip it over, all clear. So this card just means it's got a little bit of flavor text on it saying, you know, beware, bad things are happening. But for the most part, there's no extra rules. So it looks like I'm safe for the moment, except for, you know, this zombie bringing down my neck. Yeah. And that's my turn over. So over Sweet. to you. All right. So with mine, I'm going to go ahead and move up as well. Okay. So I'm going to start my first action and go here. And then I'll send my second action to open the door here. I have a zombie in front of me, so I have I can either shoot or I can move in and try to evade as well. Um, again, with this one, uh, if I've played a, a number of scenarios in Resident Evil 2, and it is very important to conserve your ammo for when it is needed. So I'm going to go ahead and move in instead, and then I'll spend my last action um, to try to evade and move into this space to go after this objective here. So again, my character has an evade of 2, so I'm going to roll 2 dice. I get up here. Maybe I'll have a better shot. Oh, yeah, see. Oh, there it is. There you go. Perfect. So you can move without any penalty at all. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and slide over here. Cool. Okay, and then during the enemy's So now turn. it's reaction phase. So the enemy's, yep, perfect. You've already got it. So one of the best things we found about Resident Evil and the survival horror engine is just how intuitive it is, how quickly players can pick it up. Having done an awful lot of demos of this, there's this really lovely sense where players go, wait, so that's as, you know, so it's really that straightforward. I can just move around wherever I want, I can attack wherever I want, I can do stuff. And it's one of the core things we always say. It's a very overused moniker that everyone applies, which is, you know, easy to learn, difficult to master. Yeah. But there is a degree of truism in it in the sense that that's how any game should be. It should be so easy just to pick up, straightforward, very user-friendly, very intuitive, so people don't have to spend hours agonizing. Yeah. And the depth really should come from the stuff that happens in the gameplay that you know people kind of pick up as they're going along, as they become more familiar with it. One of the most focused things we always did with Resident Evil is we've actually got, in Resident Evil 2, we've actually got a, a rule book layout where it actually teaches you how to play the game very slowly across. So it says, hey, here's the tutorial. This will teach you the basics of how to move around. Congratulations, you've done the tutorial. Now let's go for your first scenario. Here are some of the new rules you're going to need for this scenario. It introduces things very slowly over the course of the campaign so the players aren't overwhelmed by trying to learn everything all at once. Yeah, it's almost like they can. Yeah, every single every single time they read the scenario, they can deal with, they can interact with that new element. Go to the rulebook, find out about that new element, and bow into the information they already have for how to play the game. So it keeps everything flowing very nicely. It's a very nice sort of tutorial system, which is what we always try to do. And Resident Evil Three is no different. Yeah, so very very straightforward in that respect. Yeah, I, and I definitely enjoyed Resident Evil 2. Um, I had a lot of fun with it, and I definitely would recommend it to anyone that hasn't played it yet. Um, I do have a teaching video oh, for I'm it sorry, I'm, jump, I'm jumping ahead. I've got your attention card. Sorry. That's all right. Cool. And we're all clear. Excellent. And I just dropped it on a zombie. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, zo the zombie's perhaps not all clear. Uh, cool, so I'll go to here. Uh, I'll spend one to flip open the door. Uh, I'll do three to go here, and then... What do I want to do? I think I'm going to make an attack. So I'm going to drop my ammo down and make an attack roll. Sorry, I interrupted you. You were saying? No, that's okay. No, I was just saying um, I, I had a really good time with Resident Evil 2. Um, I did a full teaching video for it and just had a lot of fun um, going through all the different things. And definitely would recommend it to anybody that's a Resident Evil fan or enjoys these types of, of board games. It, uh, you guys really did do a, a great job of it. So, um, oh. Well, I'm glad you liked it. Thanks. Now, I did hear, obviously, that you guys are working on a new tile set 
for both Resident Evil 3 and for the, the returning backers of Resident Evil 2. So can you tell me a little bit about that and what kind of changes you guys went through and what kind of decisions were made within that to kind of correct some of the, the concerns that, that backers had or, or other people had um, from the, the Resident Evil 2 game? Sure. Um, so Resident Evil 2 was... One of the things we talked a little bit about in the pre, the, uh, the pre-campaign for Resident Evil 3 is our philosophy we had for the tile design in Resident Evil 2. Uh, because we know that there was quite a lot of feedback um, about how the tiles looked in Resident Evil 2 when they actually landed with backers. And one of the things we really sort of had when we were thinking about this is when, when, we, make, when we approach any licensed game, um, and this is also true of our own IP stuff, but for the most part it's, it's very, very important with any licensed game that we explore um, what the game actually is, what are the core um, temples of what, how, what makes this game this game. Because ultimately, we're definitely not somebody who's just going to reskin an existing engine just for the sake of going, hey, we've made a Resident Evil game, let's just reskin another game, and then suddenly it's turned into Resident Evil. We didn't want to do that stuff. So we kind of looked at a lot of our, how Resident Evil's environment works, and that's a very, and that creates lots of dark spaces, lots of very foreboding or very unwelcoming areas where there's lots of darkness around the edge, and the players feel like they're darting from one oasis of light to the next oasis of light. So they feel very uncomfortable leaving that because they don't know what's waiting for them in the darkness. And this is something which we wanted to really hone in on. We really wanted to be something where, yeah, that's part of the experience as well. So when it came to actually designing the tiles, that's exactly what we fed into our graphic designers, that's exactly what we put together, and that's kind of really where our focus was. Now what we found out, obviously once we actually released the game, we started talking to people, is, and there isn't really a right or wrong answer to this, but one thing we immediately found out was the expectations and the, and the, the um, this kind of very much the... Uh, the, the very much the sort of the general way that the system works. If you're looking at tabletop, if you're looking at tabletop gaming, is that um, you really have much brighter, much more involved uh, tiles. Like they're not they're not really going with a minimalist kind of vibe. They're really very much sort of vibrant and bright, and they jump out you and everything else. And our tiles were a very stark contrast to that. A lot of them were very shadowy. A lot of them were very dark. They were sort of brief, really bright, sort of illuminated areas, just like we talked about that didn't necessarily tie in too well with kind of what the idea was that we had. So when we came to Resident Evil 3, we really wanted to revisit this idea and go, well, okay, so let's let's turn the lights back on. Let's have a look at how this world will look and sort of really show the horrors and the devastation of Raccoon City instead through kind of having really bright tiles where they are going to show bloodstains on the floor and gun casings and discarded debris and that sort of stuff. You know, it is something where we're going to find this sort of yeah, this almost this, uh, this you know, turn the lights on and we can see the horror of what's been inflicted on this place. And that's very much what we went with. Now, this also meant, of course, one of the things we knew we wanted to do is reward our returning Resident Evil 2 backers uh, for this project. And one of the things we talked about doing is obviously having extra tile sets. And we immediately came to an idea of, well, we know that some people weren't necessarily super happy with how the Resident Evil 2 tiles looked. So what's the nicest thing we can give to those people? Well, Let's give them a free tile set. We're going to have a free tile. We're going to have a tile set anyway. So let's give them a copy of that for free for backing our project, uh, for basically showing our support and as returning backers that we thought would be a very nice gesture to kind of say to people, like you know, these are some tiles. They can work. They're designed to work with Resident Evil 3, but they'll work with Resident Evil 2 just as well. They're not replacements. They're not alternative. You know, they're not sorry. They're not replacements. They're not designed to kind of say, hey, you can throw away all your old Resident Evil 2 tiles now because you've got these new ones. They are designed to give you extra options, they give you a bit more flavor, a bit more character. They're something which is really designed to be something that you can bolt into your games of Resident Evil 2 or Resident Evil 3 to give you more um, variety and kind of help you immerse yourself a little bit more. And that's really where these tile sets are coming from. Okay. That makes sense. And I, I mean, as a, as a backer of Resident Evil 2, I really appreciate that. I mean, I was one of the people I know um, that would uh, that understands the financial requirements of these games and i you know i is a backer i was even you know willing to you know pay more for an additional set because i do understand like i said the art assets and all that kind of go, that go into these uh, is extensive um and i know one of my concerns which it seems like at least from this this demo that i'm seeing here 
is that not only are the tiles brighter, but one of the other things that I, I think that kind of hit me was that in Resident Evil 2, the tiles were fairly generic. Um, you know, it didn't really matter what what scenario you were playing, and everything looked the same where, you know, in Resident Evil 2, the game, you kind of go through the police station, the mansion, the, you know, the sewer systems, and all these different environments, and I think that was one of the things that I was most kind of displeased with with the tile sets is that there really wasn't a distinction between that. You really couldn't, you know get the feel for okay i'm in the police station now or you know now i'm in the mansion going down those hallways and into those creepy rooms or you know now i'm into the sewer making my way towards that giant alligator or you know those different things that i that really would have tied everything together as at least for me visually as a gamer um now is that something that you guys kind of addressed within the Resident Evil 3? I mean, are we going to see not only brighter tiles, but tiles that kind of have that more thematic feel where I, I know where I'm at within a scenario that I'm at this location that I remember from the game or at least giving more, I obviously not like specific right down to the, to the point, but maybe more of a generalized feel so that I can say, okay, I'm in an inter interior environment and these are some things that I kind of remember versus it just being, these are just tiles there that I'm just kind of moving through with no real feeling other than what I'm going for objective wise. Yeah, I think so. Um, I, basically, one of the things that we, one of the things we had with Resident Evil 2 is it's a very varied and quite, it does of how much you explore through the game. There's, there's quite a lot to see. There's quite a lot of yeah. stuff. And one of the things that we did um, with, with uh, sort of, you know, to kind of emphasize that, because we knew we didn't have loads and loads of tiles to play with, yeah. um, is that we, we kind of made things a little bit more generic in the sense of, hey, you could be in, uh, inside the RPD building, or you could be inside kind of, you know, a sewer kind of storeroom or something like that. You, know, you could be something where this could be a street, this cobbled street, or it could be the bomb or, or the sewers or whatever else. Um, you know, this could be a corridor inside the underground lab, or this could be a corridor, you know, in the RPD building. We really tried to hone in on kind of making things feel almost as, I want to say as generic as possible, because that sounds very much like we sap, sucked life out of them and we kind of really sort of drew a lot of excitement out of them, flavor. But we did try to give them a lot of uh, versatility. With Resident Evil 3, of course, there's less locations you go to. A lot of it is set in the city, mm. um, which means that we can afford not necessarily have to worry too much about that level of immersion, although obviously we have got lots of, as you can see, we've got interior rooms, we've got all sorts of things to play with. And you are going to go in some areas like the Raccoon City Police Department where you are inside a building or whatever else. And it's worth stressing, we have, mu we have a lot more artwork with Resident Evil 3 mm. than we had with Resident Evil 2. Okay. Uh, which means less duplicated tiles, it means less um, stuff where we kind of look at it and go, well, actually that doesn't work or whatever else. It, it's something where I think player immersion would be much, much higher. And that's before we consider, of course, there's nothing to stop you taking some of your tiles from Resident Evil 2, putting them into this if you wanted to, or taking some of your Raccoon City tiles, dropping them into this, or even from the expansion, dropping them into this. Like I know that in the All In Pledge, for example, I was showing someone earlier, there's 47 different tiles alone well, oh, 47 wow. double-sided tiles alone. Nice. That's an awful lot to play with in terms of how much extra stuff you can put into this to give you different tiles. And that's before you factor in someone like yourself who has Resident Evil 2 who says, oh, hang on a minute, I've got another you know, similar sort of number of tiles from everything I had there, so I can bolt this in. You've got loads of variety at that point. Okay. That's, that's really good to hear. All right, so moving back into the game, we kind of got sidetracked here. So it looks like it's my turn. Um, I got a zombie in my space, and I probably want to handle him before I try to pick up that objective so I don't get attacked. So... Ooh, um, well, I might have, let's try... If I remember correctly, if I do a knife attack with it... Um, I still get to push him out of my uh, space, even if I fail, correct? Correct, because you'll take some damage and you sort of throw him off, just like Resident Evil. Okay. So that's not a terrible move. It, saves, it certainly conserves ammo. So let's try that. Um, 
And then for... That's one blue dice. One blue dice. Okay. And what you're really looking for is any one of the hit icons. Um, yeah, the double hit will do, two da will do one damage. Uh, the other one will just do a push. Uh, I'm afraid you failed on that one. Uh. So you've been hit by the zombie. So okay. you'll take one damage. Uh, so your health track will drop down one. Okay. Uh, and then you also, after you've done that, you'll get to push the zombie away in any direction you want. Okay. Uh, I will push him oh, over. over here. That makes sense to me. All right, so that was... So that's your first action. First action. Second action, I'll go ahead and pick up that token. And bring my guy back over to the board. <laughs> yeah, you just sort of surfed your way off. And then I'll, uh, I'll grab you an item card and bring it up here for you. Thanks. Let's go ahead and flip that over, see what we get. And more bullets. All right. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. Those are always good. No. Well, right. I think you're uh, definitely well suited to actually attack things now. <laughs> yeah. All right. So third action, I'm going to go ahead and move there and then fourth action i'll move here cool and then the zombie's gonna follow suit move up and then we'll find out if we're still safe with the deck so move that down flip and we're still good. good okay so I'm going to shut this door for one for my turn. Uh, then I'm going to go two, three, and I'm going to open the door for this one. Oh, so I'm taking man. a bit of a risk here. I think I'm going to uh, yeah. bait these zombies into coming after me. Okay. And then try and basically flee in, shut the door on them and trap them in this room. Okay. Hopefully that's going to work for me. We'll see. So then I'll move through in the reaction phase. Uh, I'll grab one of these. And we're all good. Oh, okay. All right, so back over to me. I'll move up for one. Go ahead and flip the door for two. Move in for three. And I will close that door for four. It's very sensible. So in the reaction phase, because this tile I'm on is now linked to your tile by an open door, this basically means that I only, the zombies will try to attack me because I'm in the same square. Now, ordinarily, there's only one of them uh, that you need to worry. If there's only one of them, you can roll any of the evade dice. Uh, uh, you can roll any of the evade symbols to actually successfully make it. Because there's two, it effectively makes it more difficult. So I now can't roll this small evade symbol to try and evade. It's more difficult to do it. But on the plus side, only one of them will attack me. So it just means there's less places for me to dive away to. And I've rolled a large of eight, so it looks like I'm good. Nice. Perfect. Uh, and then you get to draw a card from the tension deck. Okay. Right. And we're good still. Excellent. Okay. So my turn, and I'm going to quickly evade, which I don't do this time. So I tried to move. Unfortunately, I, I didn't make it. So I'm going to take one damage. So I'll just quickly drop this down. I'm starting to look a bit mauled now. I'm caution health, not so good. Uh, I'm going to push the zombie that bit me away. Uh, and then I'm going to try and move away once more. Oh, hello. That's why I actually did this properly. Which I've spectacularly failed once more. <laughs> okay. Jill really isn't having a good day today. So we push this zombie out of the way. So that's two actions now. Uh, third one. I'm just going to step through the door. And then the fourth one, a bruised and battered Jill, is going, or bleeding Jill, I should say, <laughs> is going to flip the door shut and stare at Nikolai wild-eyed and go, oh my God, don't go back. <laughs> uh, I'm going to drop my health down a little bit because uh, that wasn't good. So uh, with that in mind, let's drive one of these. There's no reactions now. Okay. And flip that over. And we're all clear. We're all clear now. Oh man, is this, this is gonna pay. Bruce this is gonna. Bruce. This is gonna be a detriment to us later on. I got a feeling we're gonna have like all the bad stuff right in a row. <laughs> uh, that's kind of how it works. Yeah. So. All right. So, um, I guess I'll move here, 
And then... Oh, well, are you going to risk this? So the interesting thing, one of the interesting ideas we have with Resident Evil 2 and also Resident Evil 3, it's very Resident Evil concept, is you don't need to go in every single world if you don't want to. Okay. Like the, it's about finding out what your objective is and then going honing in on that. And there's lots of distractions we've built into it in terms of rooms that you might, you know, that might have an item enticingly sitting in there and waiting for you to go into. But at the same time, you don't necessarily know you want to risk your life doing it. Yeah, and this now, is an interesting point. I was I was playing earlier with one of our playtesters, and we were playing through one of the Nemesis scenarios. And one of the big facts we have built into this game now is decision paths when you're actually doing stuff. So if you have a narrative event, you get a choice. You know, you can either, you know, not always, but most of the time, you'll get a choice. You can go. Um, in this case, Nemesis is here. We can either fight Nemesis, although he's very dangerous, and if he defeats us, then that means you know. He's, defeat any of us then that means it's game over and we've lost that scenario or we can run away from nemesis but doing so makes the city more dangerous means that more enemies will turn up later on because we've kind of left the check on you know left the threat unchecked okay um, and they of course cho they chose to fight uh, which immediately meant hey let's let's go for this but it wasn't necessarily the best decision because a couple of the players who actually got to that point were already injured which meant that when nemesis turned up he just found he made very picked on the sort of you know, weak ones mm. and very easily just sort of picked them off and killed them, which immediately meant we failed the scenario. Oh. So there's always decisions to be made as you're going through this in terms of you know, how are our characters doing? Do we have much health? Do we have enough ammunition? What These are the factors going beyond like pulling levers and stuff and deciding how you want to do this or that or anything else. Okay. Now, um, in Resident Evil 3, did you keep the same system as Resident Evil 2 as far as the some of the different zones having different threat levels that when you went into a zone for the first time, you would have to roll a, a die to determine on that table what happens, or has that been refined or changed or removed? Uh, no, we've kept that in for Resident Evil 3. Okay. Uh, we've added in small tokens now that go into each of the rooms, so there's much oh, nice. more mechanic of, uh, it's easier to sort of keep track of, and it's a much nicer and cleaner mechanic, so that if you walk into the room, you take off the color token, and then you roll on that table, so it's nice and super super easy friendly. Oh, that's awesome, I love that. See, but if, yeah, if, yeah, if you walk into a room and it doesn't have a token, then you're not removing it, you're not removing it and you don't have to roll it. Awesome. Yeah, that that's, that's really nice that you guys added those. All right, so... I'm going to risk it. I have plenty of ammo, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. Uh, let's see. How do, and then how do I adjust my bullets here? Uh, so right click, and okay. then you should have an option which is like a plus or a minus. Okay. Let's and then you can just move down. on to the number of bullets you want to use. I have 15, so I'll go to 12 and use 3. There you go. Now, can I go to the last one? Trying to, it's giving me some problems. So yeah. basic. Oh, interesting. That's locked for some reason. Oh, we just roll one of those again, I guess. Yeah. Oh. And then probably click off and then uh, click the last one. One last shot. Come on. Oh, you got to push, which means you can push it in any direction. Okay. Uh, well, might as well push it away from me. Oop. And that was my third action, so I got one more. And let's try it one more time. So, Makes sense. Down to nine. All right. Try this again. That third one just doesn't want to be selected. It's still locked. Uh -huh. There we go. I guess we'll just uh, roll the uh, roll one the other ones again, and yeah. um, I'll have a look see why well, that's been a bit buggy. Tabletop is a really really fun platform, and it's been awesome to be able to do a demo for everybody on the Kickstarter. But um, yeah, occasionally these like any good app, there's always a software update somewhere or other that's a bit screwy and kind of means there's something completely random out that happens. Yeah. Nope, now they're right, all right. Yeah, I'll have a chat after the weekend. <laughs> Rash and lock. Yeah, it seems like the... I've got, I've got them okay on this one. Okay. There you go. I've unlocked it. You should be able to select them all now. Okay. Sorry, I see what I see what there you did go. there. All right. Yep. So I'm push. You push it another square. Oh, man. I, I, those dice hate me. <laughs> um, I think I'll probably just leave them there. I mean, I don't see a real benefit yep. of pushing them anywhere else. So. 
No. So then we have a reaction phase, and the zombie's going to stagger closer. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the tension deck card. Mm -hmm. And you're right, if we keep on drawing uh, good cards, then zero dice something bad's going to happen, so let's see. There oh, I like is. that one. <laughs> so, so, that's how cool it looks. Here we go. Uh, so, spawn a zombie in the same square as this character. So it's interesting on these cards, you'll notice something else we've done new for Resident Evil 3, uh, which is they've got different abilities now with these new icons next to them. This here refers to the city danger tracks. The more dangerous the city is, the more powerful some cards become. Okay. So as you go through the game, the same cards that you have evolve and become more dangerous. And there's different things you can do to try and stop these things from happening as long as you can. So for example, like I said, if you choose to run away from Nemesis, then you're accelerating the rate at which the city danger level uh, goes up. And that means it's more likely that these cards will turn up and become more dangerous. Or you can make decisions that are designed to keep the city danger level lower, but obviously that puts you in more immediate danger. Okay. So there's a constant push-pull depending on how you know, confident you're feeling with your chances to play the game at any given time. Uh, as it is, however, what you've successfully done is dropped a zombie in the square, which is not so good. And um, hmm. <laughs> I'm not quite sure. I have to try and find a way to help you. I'm just not sure I can... Uh, I wish I can do that. All right, let's find out. So uh, that'll be my turn, and I am going to shoot three bullets, I think. That's when I've uh, actually got the right thing. Uh, I'm going to shoot three bullets at the zombie in your square. Okay. Hopefully you'll have better luck than me. <laughs> uh, I'm going to push. Which uh. means I'm going to push this one zombie over to... I'm going to push this zombie over to here. Okay. Uh, this zombie's going to move in. Yep. I'm going to try a slightly different tact. Uh, I'm going to go over to here uh, for two, and then okay. I'm going to try and make an evade roll to shut the door. All right. I know where you were going with this, but I'm not sure, given the short volume of zombies we're having to deal with right now, it's the wisest option. So True. <laughs> shut that door open <laughs> and trap that guy away from us for the time being. Yep. Uh, so that's one, two, three. I've got one action left. Uh, I'm going to spend another three bullets trying to gun this zombie down. Okay. Uh, so that's put us on seven. And that last with a double hit is a dead zombie. Nice. So at this point, that's at least made life a little bit easier. Yep. That was a very much an emergency that had to happen. It's yeah. quite costly in my ammo as well, which is not <laughs> yeah. so good. And it also meant I didn't heal. So if something really bad happens in the tension phase, it's not so good for me. But we'll see. Mm -hmm. Oh, hello. I'm uh, moving my car around. There we are. And it's all clear. Nice. Based now. Over to you. All right. Um, now, is there anything I can do to help you? Can I uh, use no, my... No, it's okay. I mean, I've got a first aid spray, so I can heal myself anyway. Okay. Um, obviously, this is a campaign game, so it might be that I want to hang on to that, to be honest. And sort of, um, it kind of encourages me to try and hang on to those healing items. And after I finish the scenario, I can heal up to a certain extent. Okay. So, um... It's not necessarily the worst thing in the world to uh, to kind of walk around this way. It's just if I get into the danger zone of enemies is all. Gotcha. Right. You are up here. Uh, green herb. Nice. Uh, it looks like you're wounded, so that's not a lot of to use. Okay, so that was two. Uh, oh. And w we're not looking for any particular items for this scenario, are we? No, we're just trying to get out. Okay. So I'll move so up. So if we can here. get onto this green, if we can get onto this green token here, uh, then we can just basically leave the area. Okay. And then. What's this token here for? So this is a new element uh, for Resident Evil 3. This is what's a narrative event card. Okay. So when you step on here, there's a you'll have a narrative event, like a cutscene effectively plays. Okay. And at that point, it's a randomized deck, so you won't always get the same cutscenes in the same places when you go through the game. We do have some which are fixed, uh, but other ones are completely random. And this indicates that something's going to happen when you go on there. You'll remove the token and you'll draw from the narrative deck. That's that uh, one that's in negative colors next to the tension deck. 
Okay. So, I mean, you could hold off for the moment and let me sort of hit that card if you wanted to. Um, or alternatively, you could be brave and go on to it yourself. I think I'll probably wait. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Okay, so we have no reactions, but you do have a tension deck card. That's uh, cool. Yep. So we come down here. All clear. Okay. So I'm going to be bold. I'm going to go one, two, and grab this. And okay. Move it out of the way. Right. So let's flip that card over. So jammed cartridge. The last shot didn't sound right, but there's no time to check the chamber. Uh, so basically, that means this card, and I'll uh, give you a moment just to quickly screen grab it if that's what you were looking to do. Yep. Uh, basically, means that my card. One of my weapons uh, that isn't a knife, so it's got to be my handgun at this stage, uh, is jammed and cannot be used to make attacks until I clear it when using an ammunition item. Now, what's important to remember here is that this actually doesn't have, uh, this doesn't get cleared at the end of the scenario. This is something which stays this way until I actually get rid of it. Oh, wow. So that effectively means Jill is now no longer with weapon, which is not the thing to be when I'm about to open this door and encounter these zombies. But we need to go this way. So that's the thing. So I'm going to go there, and then I am actually going to use my first aid spray, given that that's just happened. So I'm going to go up by three levels. Okay. Then I'm going to discard my first aid spray. Uh, reaction phase. This zombie is going to move to just in front of me, and so is the other one. Uh, and then tension deck. Cool. It's good. Oh, well, nice. Other than that, I haven't got a weapon. I see. You. All right, so I'll move over. Or I can see through that door, right? I have line of sight through that. Yeah, I've seen camp. Okay, so yes. Okay, yeah. So I'll I'll just go ahead and take some shots on them. Hopefully, things will work out a little better, so I can try to thin the herd a little bit for you. Well, breaking them up is good, regardless yeah. of whether you kill one or not. Breaking them up is useful, as we've seen. Two zombies together is quite a dangerous threat. Uh, yeah. Two, you know, a zombie. You know, on its own is less, and even if there are two of them, at least it's easier. Okay. Oh, sorry, where you are, you would need to move to get through that door, so I'll just, I would need to, where you are there, so I would need to put you here. Okay. And therefore you can make the attack. Okay. Uh, that's a push, so you've got to push on one of the zombies. So one of them, before you do anything, is going to step through into our square. Okay. And here's the gunshot, and it's going to react. The other one, you could push it one square away wherever you wanted to put it. Okay. Well, that's, they're definitely broken up. Any further attacks you want to make, you have to attack the one in your square. Okay. So, yeah, let's do that. i got to get lucky here one of these times, right? <laughs> yeah, you're uh, you're not necessarily being the best mercenary I've seen, um, honestly, <laughs> so far. Okay. You are uh, definitely not UBCS's finest. <laughs> Um, well, <laughs> don't go to Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> so I can give you. Wow. All right, so I guess I'll be able to push him. And then that one, the other one moves up. Oop. Yep. Where'd uh, you go? I to take, uh, it's all right, I'll bring him back to the table in a moment. I managed to accidentally grab him and uh, move him off. There okay. Cool. So I moved... Took two shots so far, so I have one action left. You do. Oh man. Um. Well, there's no way I'm gonna miss with all 15 bullets. <laughs> so we've got to go. No, no, that's fair. Well, it's more so much for missing. You're hitting them, and it's just not doing anything. As true. Zombies are quite tough things if you remember the Resident Evil game. Yeah, that's true. All right, so. There's doesn't look like there's a zero mark on this, so I'll just go down to one. Uh, I guess. It's the uh, yeah, it's the sixteen. Uh, if you oh. have a look at it, you can. Um, it's a sixteen. Okay, let me get kind of lagging here a little bit. There we go. Okay, and let's see. Still free.
Come on. Hey! Uh, finally. So which one were you shooting? I'll go after that one there. Okay. Either way, so they're going to be that, there. Uh, one of ours is going to be there. He's going to move in. Yep. Okay, so that's your last action. So yep. she's moved in. She's now going to try to attack you, so you get to make an evade roll. Okay, so two... Uh, that's good. Oh no, that's terrible. That means she's uh, bitten you. You take one damage. <laughs> uh, but you do get to push her away. I thought for one magical moment that was an attack. But uh, your uh, your results are all the wrong way around. You roll evades when you need to roll attacks, and you yep. roll for attacks when you need to evade. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice work. All right, let's see what happens here. Uh, where did you want to push her to? Oh, um, let's push her back behind us. Uh, this way? Uh, uh, yeah, over here. That way we can, then the okay. room we're trying to get to. Yeah, at least isn't... yeah, that makes sense. And all clear? Well, I'm going to celebrate the fact that I don't have a weapon. I would love to stay around and try and kill that zombie, but unfortunately without a gun, I don't think it's too feasible. Yep. So I'm going to go one, two, and Jill is out. I've nice. escaped the warehouse. So uh, no draw for me, okay. uh, because I'm obviously off the board. Okay. So now your turn again. Now does the enemy react? With you being off the board still? No, no your, t your turn immediately ends as soon as you leave. Oh, wow, that's nice. Okay, so yeah, I'll just do the same thing. There you go. We have survived the demo. Nice. So what other things, I guess, um, with this one, what was your design process going into this um, that you were trying to achieve that was going to be different than in Resident Evil 2? What was going to make this one stand out when you guys went back to the drawing board and decided to do Resident Evil 3? So we knew that we were very happy with a lot part of Resident Evil 2, uh, but one of the big things we wanted to do is really expand on that open world um, design that we had uh, for Resident Evil. Yeah, you kind of experienced playing through the original Resident Evil 3 video game. There was this sense that you are in a massive, great, sprawling city, and you really need to explore it and go backtracking across it and find all sorts of different items. We really wanted to hone in on that. And uh, that's one of the big things we had. We wanted to explore, and we, we ended up with where we've sort of landed at is what we call our open world system, where it is something where your scenario progress is completely nonlinear. You can literally do it in whatever order you want to. The scenarios themselves, you set your own objectives during. Sometimes you'll play a scenario and you'll be looking for the path through to another area that you haven't discovered yet. Sometimes you'll be playing through looking for items that might unlock those areas or like valuable supplies. And other times you'll start those scenarios and there's actually a scenario built in. And maybe that can even be variable. You won't know until you actually get to a narrative event what way it's going to go. But there's lots and lots and lots of player decisions to have along the way. So there's insane amounts of replayability because the location of all of our items are randomized and because the actual order in which you do your scenarios will completely depend, change, and change from scenario from gameplay to gameplay. It's it's very, very, very dynamic. Okay. And with, I guess, with this campaign going so far, I mean, it seems like it's been very successful. You guys have unlocked a lot of, of additional stretch goals. You've gotten a couple of additional optional buys in there as well. Um, are there things that you guys are hoping to get in still within the campaign or are there other any other surprises that are waiting for backers as as we approach these final days well we've completed actually most of, well a large chunk of all of our stretch goals we have some saved over for a final speed go uh, speed run uh, on the last four hours uh, so we're trying to say new this time resident Evil 3 itself is not the largest video game if you look at resident evil 3 in terms of size comparison to resident evil 2 for example or resident evil 1 it's actually a smaller game than yes. both of those two games and um it's something where we you know as we as ever we really wanted to stick within the parameters um of the original game uh and not sort of com you know not create a convoluted game that kind of almost served two masters as it were where we start folding in other stuff from other games so we really need to phone in, uh, sort of hone in on that. And we've sort of mined it for just about everything that we possibly can. Um, there's not many things that have made it into or that are in Resident Evil Nemesis that have not made it into our board game. In fact, I think there's anything. Um, and we've, so as a result, we've kind of burned through all of our stretch goals for the main sort of course, as it were, um, now, 
So we've saved a few different extra funky things to throw into our last 48 hours to kind of give the backers that real countdown that is very Resident Evil. And to kind of get them kind of that last little push of hype and excitement as they really try to work their way towards the last stretch goals. So we're in a really good place with that stuff now. There's loads of free stuff if you're actually a backer coming into this. There's an awful lot. We try to tailor it this time around to new characters, new enemies, new game modes. It's all killer and no filler. There's no alternate sculpts, you know, that kind of zombie sculpts, or there's no um, kind of uh, quality of life upgrades for kind of cards and things or tiles because we just built that stuff into the game from scratch. We didn't want that to be something where the backers kind of felt, well, hang on, why am I having to you know, work towards that? That should just be how the game is, and we agree. We want this to be something where that's just what the game is. The only thing we've come close to that is we actually have a game trace um, stretch goal, which we smashed through in no time at all. And that's because that's something that's a little bit special, to be honest. That's something where it's not just a simple game tray, you know, a simple sort of insert that the actual thing comes with. That's something where game trays are a whole other company who specialise specifically in making this. And the way that they actually work is they integrate much more of what your game is, which is really cool. And those guys, you know, we, it's something where we wanted that to be a stretch goal because it should feel like a big deal and it is a big deal working with those guys. So, yeah. Yes. That's awesome. I, I'm definitely excited about it. I'd love to see all the different things you guys have added to this. And um, to be completely truthful, I haven't gotten into Resident Evil 3 as much as I have with a lot of the other games. Um, but I'm definitely interested to see the changes that are made with this one. I cannot wait to get this onto the table uh, once you guys get done with production. Um, definitely looking to do another video on this one uh, when that comes down the line. And uh, I just want to say congratulations again to you guys on another successful campaign um, and just adding more to Resident Evil as a whole. It's a wonderful franchise. I hope you guys continue um, with some of the other games. I'd love to see some of the other titles make their way through um, for, us, for us Resident Evil fans to, so we can experience some of those other things um, and, you know, and you guys continue to innovate and, and bring new stuff to the table when it comes to these other titles as well so uh, thank you so much for taking us through this sorry I, sh sorry, I should interrupt uh, I just want to say thank you for having me and uh, I'm a huge Resident Evil fan so to be honest getting to make these games is a real privilege and I, I'm very much like you I hope I get to carry on making them for as long as I possibly can yeah, we definitely love to see it. And um, so this one wraps up in, what, three days at this point? So we're going to be heading into the Final 48, what, Monday? Uh, yeah, Final 48 is so uh, early hours of Monday, uh, mm -hmm. Monday morning. Okay. Sweet. All right. Well, early well, hours for me. For, for you guys, a slightly different time zone. But, true. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> Very true. All right. Well, thank you again so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be talking with you again soon after the campaign finishes to kind of go into some more details. So if anybody has any questions, leave me any questions you have in the comment section below, and I'll definitely hit uh, Sherman up, and we'll try to get some more of those answers for you guys. So appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again soon.